Week 16, it has arrived, and so have we, with our flagship show. This is Stats versus Film, where we take everything that happened on the field with the tape and mesh it, mash it together with the spreadsheets, with the stats, with the metrics, and the hopes of helping you win that glorified fantasy football championship just two or so weeks away. Hayden Winks, the NFL continues to roll along. So do we. How are you doing? Doing well. Got eliminated in my most important league last week off that Jalen Hurts sideline interception. Ooh. And for the record, that toe did not hit the ground. I'm salty. <laughs> did your grandma beat you in that one? Oh, yeah. I've already been dusted by <laughs> Pat Pat. <laughs> she watched the show. I'm glad all of you do as well. It's it's great to receive feedback on Twitter of how well you guys are doing in your leagues, even when you bounce out, because we know that playoff variance is a big deal. Um, but we continue to roll on. As you know, we go team by team. And today we lead off with about six or seven headliners and we'll kick that off with the Buffalo Bills because we need to once again emphasize 49 carries for this team compared to seven completions. And obviously at the top of the list is James Cook, 25 carries, 179 yards, one touchdown. Really since Joe Brady has taken over this offense, he's averaging something like 140 total yards per game. And that has also equaled three goose eggs for uh, Gabriel Davis. The offense is completely changed. So we have the the Bills are right now dead middle when it comes to neutral pass rate. And then when they do pass the ball, a lot of them happen to go to James Cook. We had that beautiful design uh, where he's able to beat uh, the, the safety. But the Cowboys were absolutely lit up. They were second worst in rushing success rate going into this game. Even looked worse than that. Buffalo for basically two off seasons has kind of been like trying to trinkle in a little bit more runs, a little bit more of a balanced approach. And now with the new play play caller and, and Joe Brady, we're getting the full extent of it. So right now, James Cook, he's the RB two on RB 10 usage this month. And I do think while they are probably not going to be a, this effective on the ground, yeah. they will certainly try to be in neutral situations, more balanced than we've ever seen with uh, Josh Allen stat. From the great Ed Werder, James Cook was first contacted at or behind the line of scrimmage on only one of his 25 rushes Wow! on Sunday. I mean, that is just not so stuff, right? I also wanted to bring this up because I love going through these offenses, especially when they you know, focus on just one aspect like this ground game. What I noticed from Joe Brady and the Buffalo Bills this week was, as you can see, James Cook starts on the left side, then a quick shift just before the snap changes the angles. So like in this case, you can see that that totally messes with 33 and 14, the defensive side of the ball, and then goes into a positive gain. There have been other examples, like here, a quick shift just before the snap, along with a pulling offensive line, this time right tackle, Spencer Brown. So number one, the defensive player goes from, okay, this run is going to be away out of shotgun to James Cook on the opposite side to, oh no, the run is coming to me. And it leaves number one just totally in no man's land and gets run around. So again, these tiny little tweaks when the emphasis of the offensive attack is on one aspect and is so successful, this comes down to what a coach saw heading into a matchup and he, what he wants to exploit. And obviously the Bills probably didn't plan, as Joe Brady said, to run the ball 49 times, but yeah. they were just dominant up front in that regard. If it's working, it's working. And yeah, so I, I'm expecting more of a balanced approach. Obviously, that's meant terrible things for Steph Diggs this month. He's the wide receiver 39 on wide receiver 26 usage. Now he can't have a meltdown because they're winning by so many points in these games against a big competition. But Steph Diggs is definitely taking L's. Gabe Davis is taking L's. And then last week, because the ground game was so strong, Dalton Kincaid took it out, and that's because we have Dawson Knox back in the lineup. They're transitioning more into 12 personnel at times, especially in a game like last week. Once you have the ground game going, you're not going to need Dalton Kincaid, a slider-framed guy who had one drop in the game. You'd rather use Dawson Knox a little bit better of a run blocker, a lot more size there. So this balanced approach actually goes against their first round investment in Dalton Kincaid. He's more of a spread them out, get him into the slot type of formation. So this up and down nature of the, of the offense is hurting the pass catchers while obviously James Cook is becoming a league winner. Yeah, these last three weeks, it's obviously been a buy for the Buffalo Bills, then 4.6 and zero fancy points for Dalton Kincaid. We know anyone who's in the semifinals is not playing Gabe Davis in their lineups, no. but they might be playing Dalton Kincaid or, or thinking about it. So you really can't. I wouldn't. Basically what no, he'll be outside the top 10 for me. Yeah. 
Two more thoughts. Joe Brady obviously now took over for Ken Dorsey. And while I think, not the criticism, but the point made when Ken Dorsey was fired of, okay, if they make that field goal, uh, or excuse me, if they do not call the timeout or the penalty right. and the field goal is made against them, they probably don't fire Ken Dorsey. Joe Brady has obviously been a big advantage for this team. And what I always love to point out is back when he was the play caller of the Panthers, Teddy Bridgewater was at quarterback and all of Mike Davis, DJ Moore, Curtis Samuel, and Robbie Anderson all got over 1000 total yards productive in that season. That's yeah. pretty dang good. And final point, mm -hmm. I pointed out all those misdirections and slight shifts in motion against this Cowboys defense and how they couldn't stop the run because of it. Do you want to know who they play here in uh, week 16? The Miami Dolphins. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, they're missing a defensive tackle, Cowboys. They need them back and because they have a 205-pound linebacker. I'm significantly bigger than 205 pounds, as you guys know now. Yeah, as, as the commenters love to point out. Okay, that's just one team. We've got 31 more to go. This is the time of year where we get, like, no subscribers. So if you are watching this and you've been watching us all season long or you're just starting now, hit that subscribe button. Leave a thumbs up. I really, really need to get us to 100,000 subscribers, guys. I, I'm beyond the 100,000 subscribers. I just want you guys to know we are an off-season channel. We are going to be going grinding oh, yeah. really hard for NFL draft stuff. So don't leave us. Don't even You don't have to subscribe. Just don't leave us throughout the off-season. How about that? Yeah, some might say, Hayden, we might need to get to 20 or 25 wide receivers in order to get to 100,000 subscribers this year. No, not me. <laughs> Atlanta Falcons are next. The people are irate. I rate about Arthur Smith once again and his usage of top 10 draft pick Bijan Robinson. I will remind you just seven carries for 11 yards, one catch for three yards. Your take this month. He's the running back 14 or running back 17 usage. Right. When I thought we were going to get a full breakout, Bijan Robinson has a bad game. Now they were using Tyler Algier and Cordero Patterson before that fumble, but the fumble obviously really hurt him down the stretch there. The Falcons missing Chris Lindstrom is a huge deal. This offensive line is not good. And when they're not good, it's hard to have a steady ground game. And the Falcons ground game has been super disappointing this entire year. Bijan's super flashy right now, but there's been a couple of mistakes. Obviously, Arthur Smith is not going to give him the benefit of the doubt because he obviously does like Tyler Algier. And then on top of that, Desmond Ritter, we can't be having those interceptions in the red zone. You're removing all of the inside the five run opportunities that we were promised from Bijan, who had three goal line opportunities last week. Well, guess what? When Desmond Ritter's throwing picks uh, at the seven yard line, <laughs> bye bye those touches. Um, I'm not going to give a monologue here, but also lost in like the I can't believe Arthur Smith didn't play Bijan Robinson more was this brutal fumble that he had inside his 25 yard line that we talked about in the instant reaction show. It gifted the Panthers three points. This was with 16 minutes left. In the game. Um, and so I did some digging because one, I think because of this action, there was a reaction by Arthur Smith and some in the league, some old school, some new. If you're fumbled, you're benched at times. And obviously, Bijan didn't have a touch after this. We've also seen it from like the likes of Sean McVay this past week when Kyron Williams fumbles twice, he still gives him 34 opportunities. So I understand both sides of it. Mm -hmm. But from a fancy football standpoint, we can scream into the void as much as we want to about he should be used more so and so and we do it all the time but at the end of the day it is all about adjusting to what actually the coach is going to do right and so what i noticed when going through the Bijan robinson carries is look at all of these light boxes he was running into or lighter boxes you know shotgun wide maybe five four six in the box mm -hmm. versus Tyler Algiers carries, which is, you know, you get seven in the box, eight in the box, stuff like that, right? To me, the Panthers, because of weather, a total lack of pass threat on the Atlanta Falcons, they actually play base defense, hitting the highest rate in the league this past week at 52% of snaps. Typically, the Falcons only face base defense on 33% of their offensive snaps. Okay. So I think if I can point this to this and equals this, it's pretty clear that Arthur Smith prefers Tyler Algier to run into these heavier boxes and likes lighter situations to Bijan Robinson on top of not having him touch the ball in the entire fourth quarter. And obviously Algier and CPAT sharing five of those touches at the end. And that equals a low touch volume here. 
that makes sense. That's basically the thesis of why Tyler Algier was getting the goal line opportunities for most of the season until this spot. So, yeah, I mean, Bijan, fantastic player, super gifted, of course. Oh. He's just still a rookie, and rookies are still learning the playbook and all that stuff. But I really do think the Falcons' offensive line was probably, what, top three, top five last year. It hasn't been that. No. And they're trying to do a lot of things at, at once to try to hide the quarterback. Now we're pivoting to Taylor Heineke. Yeah. Unfortunately, if we're trying to limit turnovers and bad decisions, T Taylor Heineke is not exactly that. So I think a lot of these problems that the Falcons have will continue right now, of course, for Drake London. Falcons way, way, way dead last in wide receiver usage. We saw that last week in the weather. I'm not expecting a lot of changes from this Falcons offense from Ritter to Heineke. Quite frankly, I just think they're fairly similar players. I mean, it's objectively hilarious that Arthur Smith is going back to Taylor Heineke. I know. You know, I mean, this is the situation you put yourself in. Ritter could have been benched at times this year, even when you said, like, I don't know what tape you're watching. Yeah. Uh, not the tape that I watched that Desmond Ritter should be the starter. And then Taylor Heineke comes in and we actually agree that Desmond Ritter puts them in a better position to succeed. And now you go back to Taylor Heineke. It just shows flip flopping and uncertainty about your decision making. And you have to make a decision and move forward with it. Not this again, back and forth. Ryan Tannehill last off season would have been so much easier. Um, one final thought that people are going to want to know. I know at least one team against me advanced, even though they had B. John Robinson, on the roster. Can we trust him here in week 16? You have to, you have to. And I'll add a note on top of it. I talked about that base defense and how it seems like Arthur Smith prefers Tyler Algier into them. They face the Indianapolis Colts this week. They run their base personnel defense only on 18.8% .8 of snaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll probably have them running back 13, 14 and kind of adjust for matchups there. More backfields, the Detroit lions. I mean, there's so many, talking points here uh but first do you have the chart of jameer gibbs and dave montgomery because the people are savages some might call them selfish savages and despite you know the 18 ish touches that we got from dave montgomery they wanted more they wanted a touchdown and obviously jameer gibbs scored too yeah dave montgomery was out there playing a bunch got the usage that we're looking for unfortunately jameer gibbs drive and it is more or less a drive by drive rotation Jameer Gibbs gets the goal line opportunity. Jameer Gibbs looks fantastic right now. He's beating yep. everybody to the edge. What was super key in this game versus against the Bears the previous week, the offensive line is healthy. Frank Ragno, if you watch these clips, watch the center, and then watch the ability of both, both the tackles to move plus their physicality. It's a special unit, and Jameer Gibbs has the speed to take advantage of that little crease uh, that David Montgomery probably doesn't get to the edge quite as often. Now, David Montgomery still easily could have scored two touchdowns in a game like this. The Lions at home with a healthy offensive line, that's the formula we're looking for. This is a kind of drive-by-drive -drive rotation between these guys. The, the snaps on stuff will be fairly similar. Jameer Gibbs obviously provides more juice. He's a little bit better in negative game scripts, so I'll rank him ahead. But we can be doing the show next week, and David Montgomery could have 80 yards and a touchdown very easily. Totally agree. I mean, right now you're looking at the running back seven overall in fancy points per game this season and Jameer Gibbs and the running back eight overall in fancy points per game. And that's David Montgomery. Uh, that is not bad. I'm totally with you on the offensive line comment. I do want to bring up that this week's opponent is the Minnesota Vikings. They play them twice in the final three games. But we always, always talk about when the Vikings come to town or you go there is the exotic, funky, pressure looks from all different angles that Brian Flores brings. And maybe the closest thing to that, that the lions have seen this year was week one against the Kansas city chiefs. When they kept blitzing their middle linebacker over and over and over again, that was so long ago. But remember that David Montgomery was playing way more than Jameer Gibbs at that same point and was asked to one-on-one -on -one keep Jared Goff protected. Yeah. Um, this is to me going to be a great indicator of just how far the trust levels have gone to Jameer Gibbs. Obviously, it's, it's there in the running game. But now in pure pass pro situations, how do Dan Campbell and and, and Ben Johnson, you know, mm -hmm. believe in Jameer Gibbs holding up in those one-on-one -on -one situations? Because it's not as simple as you can just send him on a route. 
No, it's going to be you have to protect your quarterback, who was one of the most unathletic quarterbacks in the league. In their running back rankings video of all the stats, but teams don't run the ball against the Vikings. They also don't throw the ball to their running backs because you have to sit there and hold up. If Jameer Gibbs is out there for a bunch of these snaps, get ready to be drafting Jameer Gibbs at least in the second round next year. People, the hype train will be crazy. Speaking of hype trains, Sam Laporta just wanted to repeat this again. He is now the highest scoring rookie tight end in NFL history in fantasy points, and there's still three games left. He is an absolute monster out there. The size uh, could have been a potential issue. It has not been like that on tape at all this entire season. Obviously, he has the athletic skills to get going. So perfect scheme fit with Ben Johnson, and I think very much a perfect scheme fit with Jared Goff, but Sam Laporta, the talent by himself, is extremely, extremely real. He does everything well. And after your point of this is the greatest fantasy rookie season ever, this statement might not sound outlandish. He has every trait to one day be called the best tight end in the NFL. It's it's that simple. You saw it in that long Jameer Gibbs run. You know, he goes in there, sticks his nose as the blocker that works across the formation on number 92. Uh, you'll see in some of these that his athleticism in the open space, uh, his agility allows him to separate versus defensive mm-hmm. backs. And then on that short touchdown that he had, his frame is too wide and he's too difficult to work around for someone like Patrick Sertan in, you know, rhythm and timing throws. Mm -hmm. Like those are all the elements of maybe the most complete tight end once some of these veterans eventually retire. And who knows if the next play caller is going to be as good as Ben Johnson is at featuring a guy like Sam the Porter. It feels like those are few and far between. Um, but if it is, then we're going to have Sam Laporte in our lives for a very, very long time. Him and McBride at the top of the tight end rankings next year. We'll see. Right. And then, hey, we get a buy low on Luke Musgrave. I hope. I hope. <laughs> Speaking of, let's go to the Green Bay Packers now. Jane Reed, massive, massive week. Uh, we talked about it in the situation that was without Christian Watson. That led us to, obviously, Jane Reed because he has been more of a manufactured touch Underneath type player, we've always thought he had more to the game that he could bring. And here it was six for 52 and one. Um, He's used out of the backfield as a wide receiver. And Hayden, I also want to put it on record. Where to me, the three wide receivers that should be emerging from this young unit next year is Christian Watson, Jane Reed, and their wide receiver three is Dontavian Wicks as he overcomes and surpasses Romeo Dobbs. And I'll take Jaden Reed over Christian Watson straight up as well um, for fantasy purpose as well. He can just do a little bit of everything. He's going to get all the manufacturer touches in the last two games without Christian Watson, 15.4 and 12.1 expected points. I think he's a really good player. Jordan Love uh, is still a little bit inconsistent, but you can see the traits there as well. Good throw on the run here to get Jaden Reed's toes inbound. So Jaden Reed is all the way back up to the wide receiver 14 in usage this month. And then Dontavian Wicks, to your point, is the wide receiver 56 ahead of Romeo Dobbs as the wide receiver 62. So yeah, Romeo Dobbs, the contested catch ability is there, but they're trying to see if Dontavian Wicks is more than just that. And uh, I've seen him on tape a couple times already this season. I not get a chance to watch Aaron Jones, did you? Aaron Jones struggled uh, to like really bust off a big play, but he was the RB2 in usage immediately came back and had 17.7 expected points without AJ Dillon. We'll see if Dillon can return on that broken thumb, but it is very clear to me that they need Aaron Jones to, to work around. So hopefully he looks a little bit better. There's a lot of injuries he's played through as a 28 year old uh, running back, but he's just the most relied upon option. And this offense looks a lot more intriguing than the one we were trying to buy, buy into at the very beginning of the season. So I do think that Aaron Jones has a chance to have some big games down the stretch, and I was kind of not expecting that uh, in the early parts of the season. Best they can finish is 9-8. and eight. They have the Panthers, the Vikings, and the Bears to close it out, so 9-8 and eight is definitely mm-hmm. achievable. I wonder if, because these players are so young, and Hayden, everyone always talks about the year two and year three breakout, guess what? All of these skill players are going to be year two or year three breakouts. Mm -hmm. That if there's even going to be like a buy low window this offseason, even if it wasn't a consistent from start to finish for any of the names this season. Yeah, I'll be buying low on Luke Musgrave. I don't don't care what the price is. Yeah. (laughs) Do 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 you think it will be Reed over Christian Watson in BBM5 rankings? I think so. 
Yeah, I think so too. I think Jane Reed's going to close out the season at a really high note. Yeah, I agree. On a really high note. Minnesota Vikings are next. Yeah, buddy. It's Ty Chandler season. Uh, first, from Kevin Seifert from Kevin O'Connell's press conference, said that Alexander Madison's ankle will work toward rejoining practice this week, uncertain whether he or Ty Chandler would start on Sunday. But KOC said Chandler is, quote, absolutely a guy that is going to see a featured, featured role in our offense. Hayden, love to hear it. Totally deserving. He had 17.7 expected points as the bell cow last week. Kenny Nwangu barely played. Uh, so it's Ty Chandler who has the size and the speed to be a bell cow. And there were a couple plays where there were barely oh, this close to ripping off like 50 yard uh, gains as well. I thought he looked really strong out there. Alexander Madison has guaranteed money going into next year, but I do think they're going to try to let Ty Chandler cook out there. Um, so as long as Nick Mullins could avoid the turnovers, which has been a problem, I do think that Ty Chandler is very much going to be in the mix here, both as a receiver, which they try to give a, a lot of screens and check down opportunities to him. But also, I thought this offensive line for the Minnesota was pretty damn good uh, run blocking wise. A lot of athletic players down there. So it's a good athletic kind of ground game between this offensive line. Obviously, Ty Chandler is like a 90th percentile athlete. The other point here is what we heard from Kevin O'Connell about Nick Mullins. This quote stood out. The biggest thing is Nick showed he can execute our offense and really move the football team. By execute the offense, that is clearly why he is starting over Joshua Dobbs. He wants this all to be in structure, in phase, be an extension of the play calling on the field because I trust my designs and everything that I've put out there mm -hmm. um, in comparison to the high variance-ness of Joshua Dobbs. Um, in that regard, Hayden, how do we handle the likes of Jordan Addison heading into the fantasy semifinals? So obviously I had a fantastic game. I did not see that one coming and I'll put on some of the tape here. The two touchdowns were absolutely ridiculous. Obviously plays like this. So that's what we're talking about with Nick Mullins being able to handle the offense, throw the ball on time to the right area. Now Nick Mullins' pass is kind of hang in the air a little bit and that's why he's had a lot of and interceptions. Late. Yes. But the two touchdowns for Jordan Addison were absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the, the first one on a little crossing route, Nick Mullins barely gets the ball off. Jordan Addison catches the ball at the shoestring. It's this one right here. Uh, how this one turned into a touchdown beyond my grasp. It seems like Jordan Addison's making a big play every single week. And then the second touchdown was just scramble drill in the end zone. And Nick Mullins made a play. So I don't think those were necessarily the most sticky type of looks. They weren't like schemed up looks. They were just happened to be big plays. I don't think that Nick Mullen's going to have the same stat line that he had this last game. I do think that Justin Jefferson over time will still separate and be the clear number one. So I, I don't want to say I'm completely out on Jordan Addison because he's clearly just so damn good that he's very yeah, much. We love his talent, mix. but I wouldn't be surprised if he's still kind of a, a flex play. I wouldn't go and like chase this into like the wide receiver two rankings in his regard, like in his corner here. We always know that the Cincinnati Bengals are a defense this season that we can get after, mm -hmm. you know, next week it's the Detroit Lions. The week after that is the Green Bay Packers. You know, okay. this is a nice three game stretch. Mm -hmm. Now the Lions do get back probably Chauncey Gardner Johnson at some point, but that doesn't move the needle here in terms of their entire defense. And if you have a pass pro plan for Aiden Hutchinson, that is the one guy you have to keep your eyes open for. And beyond that, you can take advantage of them. So like, Again, this isn't even average defenses that Jordan Addison and company are having to face. These are like bottom of the barrel defenses. So that should, you know, allow him to probably be more efficient on his opportunities. Temperature check on Justin Jefferson. He had 11.1 expected points last week, which is like wide receiver two numbers. Can we still call him an elite wide receiver one? Obviously, the expectations are way different without Kirk Cousins. But like if Justin Jefferson is like my wide receiver 10 this week, would that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, and it's with Hawkinson. Like he, I think, yeah. if the McBride guys have passed him up because this offense is not going to be as good, but he's still the tight end six, something like that. Yeah, I mean, what earlier in the year this team was top three in neutral pass rate, you know, with Kirk Cousins at the helm, and even though Nick Mullins offers you something different than Joshua Dobbs, again in terms of actually executing the offense mm -hmm. how it wants to be, that doesn't mean they're going to be top three. Yeah. And Ty Chandler, you know, he's getting the damn rock at this point as well. Oh my God. <laughs> this year's Zay Jones. You heard it back on August 25th. Okay. Baltimore Ravens. One of the most electric players 
of the season, Keaton Mitchell, done for the year after nine carries, 73 yards, two catches, 15 yards. Um, on the season, Hayden, that was 47 carries and just nine receptions. So 56 carries for about 500 yards and two touchdowns that we saw from Keaton Mitchell this year. He was such a monster, man. The speed, I mean, very similar to what we're getting from Devon Achan. It's such a bummer. It seems like this is a multi-ligament knee injury, mm -hmm. and we're really late into the year. It's hard for these small guys to bounce back like this as well, so I hope that we can get him back at some point next year, but expectations have to be somewhat low. It's pretty similar to the J.K. Dobbins injury, sadly. So, I mean, brutal run out for Baltimore. It seems like every single year with uh, the offense, Mark Andrews gone. Now we have Keaton Mitchell out of there as well. So more pressure for Justice Hill and Gus Edwards. Obviously, Gus Bus is going to be the goal line back. He's averaged like about 11.1 points before Keaton Mitchell showed up. That's like RB3 numbers, maybe RB2, depending on the matchups. Justice Hill will have to play more snaps. I think they're like calling up Melvin Gordon. Yep. I mean, he's not going to be much of a factor. I think it's just going to be Gus Bus and Justice Hill. But I mean, brutal run out for Keaton Mitchell. Hopefully that he well, gets ready because that dude was electric. Brutal run out for the Ravens, man, because Mark Andrews is a difference maker. It felt like the other difference maker was Keaton Mitchell in terms of being able to take a carry to the house. Odell, they're still keeping around like 60% or less snaps. Yeah. To me, they're saving that for the playoffs and maybe he can be a difference maker once they get there. And then obviously, Zay Flowers is just hit or miss with his involvement. I mean, just mm -hmm. one catch here for seven yards, and that's it for the entire game. Meanwhile, yeah. Isaiah likely comes in and makes an unreal contested catch on an extended play, five receptions, 70 yards, and a score for him. Um, straight up, Isaiah likely or Don Kincaid for... Oh, likely for sure. Now. Yeah, yeah well, this yeah. is for sure Isaiah likely. Lamar Jackson, the last game, his ability to buy time, obviously I'm not, this isn't new, but... It's so magnificent to watch. And all those plays down the field were all because of Lamar Jackson. Right now, he's plus 500 to be the MVP. He doesn't have the numbers of a typical MVP candidate. He's going to have to have massive games down the stretch to actually get in the conversation. But he at least gets to go face Brock Purdy, the current favorite, uh, on primetime this weekend, and then goes and plays the Dolphins. This team has a chance to be kind of 13-4, and 14-3, and three, something like that. So uh, maybe Lamar Jackson get hot here. But he's going to need... Zay Flowers or Odell Beckham to pop up because I mean Rashad Bateman again. I mean the dude downfield could just not track the ball. I I don't I can't believe my eyes because this was a completely different player in college. So it will be Zay, Odell, and Isaiah likely, and then Gus Edwards at the goal line. Okay, you pitched it before. Should we throw a curveball and go reverse alphabetical order today? Let's do it. Why not? <laughs> okay, I'm not prepared for this, but we'll do it anyways. Washington Commanders are up next. I just threw off producer Weave so bad. I just realized that he had he had clips loaded. <laughs> and in the last second, everyone shout out Weaves in the comments. Do it for him. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Okay, Washington Commanders first. I mean, Sam Howell played like trash. 11 of 26, under two yards, yada, yada. We talked about it on Instant Reaction Show on Sunday night. Meanwhile, Jacob Brissett, if you want to talk about EPA, if you want to talk about mm -hmm. actual eye tests, came in there. 8 of 10, 124 yards, two touchdowns to me. Hayden looked composed, looked in rhythm, was willing to fire down the field, not just, you know, chicken with your head cut off and run around. But immediately afterwards, Ron Rivera said that Sam Howell is going to be our starting quarterback moving forward. They, You can't save your job with Jacoby Brissett. Um, not that there's a job to be saved. This team has the fourth overall pick currently. Um, but Sam Howell just, when you watch a veteran quarterback, you can see the poise difference. And I'm not sure if we're going to ever get that taken out of Sam Howell, the sacks, the, the turnovers, just not hitting Terry McLaurin. I mean, it was crazy that Terry McLaurin can go this entire season, be a regression candidate, goes the entire week 14 game or week 15 game as a regression candidate. And then in one drive, Jacoby Brissett gets him there. So super, super crazy to watch McLaurin. He's the wide receiver 20 in usage this month has not been ranked that high because of Sam Howell. I, I don't think that they can go to Jacoby Brissett. They have to see what, they have in Sam Howell, I guess, but I don't think the commander should go into this offseason thinking that Sam Howell is their guy. I think that is a backup plan currently, even though um, this past regime has called him the franchise guy. Yeah, I mean, Howell was just pure chaos. Leaves clean pockets, rolls out, inaccurate passes. Terry gets his fingertips on it, intercepted. Yeah. And then again, Jacoby just walks in there, trusts his offensive line just enough, and then we'll just launch it vertically, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that Sam Howell hasn't had his moments this year. Like, he has, and it's also to the point that 
we are just now hitting basically the rookie season that is complete for Sam Howell. So look, in terms of being a year two guy, he truly hasn't been in terms of on-field action. But I do think, rightly or wrongly, a fifth round grade attached to him does carry weight mm -hmm. versus other rookies that struggle, especially when you are surrounded by Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, and Curtis Samuel and company. Yeah, and throw in Eric Bieniemy. That was like a huge move for the offensive coordinator too. So I don't know. They have to hire a head coach, and I'm not sure how many head coaches are going to be like, yes, Sam Howell for sure. I want to attach myself to them. So we'll see what they do there. Uh, in the meantime, it was Antonio Gibson the first half. In the second half, like you said in the recap show, uh, Chris Rodriguez played a whole lot more. Maybe they kind of stick with him. Uh, they also had, what's his face, Jonathan Williams get in yep. there. He left early on, but you can see it was Antonio Gibson. And then late in the game, they it pivoted is. to Chris Rodriguez. So the trust factor for Antonio Gibson is very low um, with Brian Robinson dealing with an injury. No team has a worse run out the rest of the way when uh -oh. it comes to opposing defenses either. Jets, 49ers, Cowboys. Man, they're going to be watching a lot of Jaden Daniels tape uh, in the Washington office. That's my prediction. Okay, Tennessee Titans. Mm -hmm. Did you see the comments from Derrick Henry this week? Um, basically suggesting Sad. that it's, one, this is my last ride with the Tennessee Titans. Wish I could do more. Um, wish we won more. Um, but, man, that just makes my ears perk all the way up for Tajay Spears in 2024. Titans are going to be moving on from Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill, kind of a reset se season to see what they have uh, going the next year. I think that Will Levis has done enough, very much boom bust. Some of the same flaws that we're talking about with Sam Howe, I think can be applied to Will Levis, but at least Will Levis has the size and draft capital attached to him. Yeah. With Derrick Henry, I mean, beyond brutal game last week, they couldn't pass block. They couldn't run block. They couldn't block period on either side of the ball in the trenches. Um, yeah. So the foundation of this team is one win in the trenches and then get some big plays. They don't have either of those right now. So it's a big reset time. We'll see what happens with Derrick Henry, but even still, they're not getting Ty J Spears enough chances like to trust him down the stretch. So I think they'll still ride out Derrick Henry for the rest of the season, even if things aren't looking good uh, for playoffs. Right. And what we did see a couple weeks ago, though, when Derrick Henry missed the entire fourth quarter, to me, was a preview of what we are going to see next season, because obviously the GM isn't going anywhere. He was just hired. And I don't think Mike Vrabel's going anywhere because he probably has, mm -hmm. you know, enough goodwill in the bank, despite what this might be a five and 11 or five and 12 record or six and 11, whatever it is at the end of the year. Um, and I'm excited for Tajay Spears. He's super electric. He's super shifty. This is the time to take advantage of him on the field because he's on a rookie contract. Mm -hmm. And I think he can be really, really fun next year. And Will Levis, the injury doesn't seem as bad as it initially looked like. It was one of those situations on broadcast where they're like, we're not going to show you the replay because this is yeah. awful. But then it turned out to just be like an ankle sprain. And yeah. I'm guessing he'll play this week, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, Will Levis without the scrambling ability does scare me. Um, so maybe we go back to Ryan Tannehill. If Ryan Tannehill even wants to go out there, I'm sure that Ryan Tannehill does. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins up and down, downfield shots. Some of those w uh, were completed to Traylon Burks this year. I mean, you kind of forget that Traylon Burks is even on the Titans. because uh, Third-year breakout. Maybe he's the new Nico Collins. No, 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 no. I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, th this team just doesn't have a lot of talent. It's the same kind of rant i went on uh last in the in the recap show just who are the star players if jefferson is, is, isn't out there tampa bay buccaneers the bake show 381 four touchdowns we talked about it on sunday night my attention immediately though wants to turn to rashad white mm -hmm. i mean to me it is crazy that this dude had just 98 receiving yards in the opening five games of the season that's just under 20 yards per game and then basically after the bye week, he's averaging 41 receiving yards per game. And he is a weapon. And it felt like during the bye week that they realized, despite the hot start of, okay, this guy against linebackers, this guy in the open space on angle routes is, again, a mismatch nightmare. And then, I mean, as we saw, and the wide angle shows it even better, this sweet-ass play that Dave Canales draws up with 83 drawing the attention of 26, just enough. You can see 88 K Dotton literally pushing Deion, Devondre Campbell. And then we get a seam route, a seam route 
from Rashad White for a touchdown, then boom, open field, the house. Love me. Love me some Rashad White coming out of Arizona State. And uh, I should have drafted way more of him this year. He he just hit everything that we needed from him. There was concerns. He's going to be the short yardage back after a really bad season as a rookie in that area. He's handled that. And then Dave Canales has just been a better offensive coordinator than everybody was expecting. Uh, looking back at some of the Seahawks struggles this year, you can maybe say maybe Canales could really coach. And then Baker Mayfield, I'll, I'll say he's a league average quarterback this year. I mean, he absolutely diced up. Green Bay. I do like these running back routes where instead of chopping it off and going inside or outside, they're now like what we saw with the James Cook play, just run right by the linebacker or safety that's meeting these guys uh, for ex a potential explosive play. And back at Arizona State, Rashad White was an awesome yeah. pass catcher out in the flats and the screen game and all that stuff. So we're really starting to see that Rashad White is now the running back five and running back 14 usage this month. And then the other thing we need to talk about is the wife narrative when we get the wives on, on social media and they start calling out the play callers, obviously Chris Godwin balls out. I going back and watching this, obviously Chris Godwin had a fantastic game, but to me, I mean the Packers put a guy in the middle of the field every once in a while. I mean, a safety, a linebacker, somebody, the middle of the field was open the entire game. This is what Packers fans have been complaining about for a very long time. They invest into the linebacker and safety position and nobody is ever there. I don't, I don't know what's up. Now they face the Jacksonville Jaguars this week who have had some of their own struggles this year in the uh, pass defense game on top of it. So, yeah, this could be a real strong ending for Baker Mayfield. Um, believe he's only being paid like $4 million this year. Um, we'll see what contract he gets. I mean, mm -hmm. he's staying with this team next year. I think, know, so that simple. I think so, too. It's that simple. Uh, then the Saints and the Panthers to close out the season after the Jaguars. For the Bucks. Okay, let's go to the Seattle Seahawks, where Dave Canales was the quarterback's coach last year for Geno Smith and his resurgence. And now, on Monday Night Football, what a performance from Drew Locke, man. Uh, we asked early on this season, what has been your favorite play during JSN's rookie year? That back of the football fingertip catch definitely showed out. And if you don't, and if Kenneth Walker is not one of your favorite players in the league. Do you even like football? It's a fair question. Uh, every single time he touches the ball, he's at least fun. Now, sometimes he'll get absolutely lit up behind the line of scrimmage. Guess what? I don't really care about that because the guy is catching and making guys misses, and then he's bouncing off huge plays. So yeah, Kenneth Walker, it's hard to fully trust him because he's still like this month, for example, is only the running back 29 in usage. But damn, is he fun. I really wish Charbonnet was on another team. And yeah, Cool story for Drew Locke to pull the thing off. It was not a consistent game uh, for the entire game until that last drive. Yet DK Metcalf funneled some looks back to back. I mean, DK Metcalf made a couple of fantastic grabs. And then obviously JSN uh, winning a route on the outside down the field. That was basically the first time that we have seen that from him. So right now, running our wide receiver 30 in usage for Metcalf, 40 for Lockett, 44 for JSN. It's still going to be hard for me to trust Lockett and JSN in semifinals, uh, but it seemed like we were very close to getting Geno Smith back. And that final drive, DK Metcalf like really took over Dude. until that final touchdown, just like Ooh. bullying corners. I disagree with you. I think we can trust Kenneth Walker this week because while the usage over the last month, I, I totally get what you're saying. I think it comes with some caveats. One, obviously Kenneth Walker coming back from injury. Uh, and the only other game that he played in December was against the San Francisco 49ers. Right. And they were, you know, losing 28 to 16. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't going to get a bunch of run. Now, against the Philadelphia Eagles, also a good defensive line, um, 19 carries, 86 yards. And then this week, they get the Tennessee Titans, which we'll see if Jeffrey Simmons plays. And obviously, Tyre Tart is now a Houston Texan. <laughs> but they still have a couple of good pieces. But still, yeah. To me, this is like part of their identity. And it's clear that in this game, with both coming off injury, the team yeah. prefers Kenneth Walker still over Zach Sharpman. Yeah, how could you not? I, I guess it's just like, I wish Kenneth Walker had the running back 10 usage. Yeah. Uh, it just, I wish he had Rashad White's usage. Exactly. Um, he'll still be an RB2 in my rankings. San Francisco 49ers. Man, it feels like we're doing the show backwards. Um, there's nothing to say about this team because they're all so good. You know what? What left is there to say about the San Francisco I, 49ers? I have a, I have a take. Okay, Kyle Shanahan for Coach of the Year. I mean, what are we doing here? This is a historic, historic offense by every single metric. 
Brock Purdy, if he is in the MVP conversation, if he does win it, I mean, how much credit does Kyle Shanahan get for developing Brock Purdy? This is a day three player. Uh, after all, these guys are wide open. On top of that, Kyle Shanahan, th does a single offense in defense lose as many assistant coaches and coordinators True. as what Kyle Shanahan has gone with? I know that this isn't the typical formula for coach of the year. We like to give it to rookies or a team that wins three or four more games than expected. But this team's kicking everyone's ass right now with a day three quarterback that he developed. And he, I mean, they just completely swung and missed on Trey Lance. We haven't heard anybody complain about that in a very long time. And this team just keeps going crazy. So I would like to put Kyle Shanahan very much in the coach of the year award because he is absolutely dicing up everybody. They're number one in the screen game. They're number one, the play action stuff. Yep. The ground game is historic. I mean, come on now. Should he get credit for trees as well? Like the Mike McDaniel tree? Should he get why not you know, credit for this? I like the point that you're making because I mean, if you look through the history of coach of the year, it's all based on preseason expectations. And that's why often it goes to first or second year head coaches who turn around the team right. and then those coaches or GMs for GM of the year yeah. are gone in the next few years because it's not it winning, <laughs> you know, 14 games in a season. Right. Like but what I mean, the 49ers are going to do this year. But also the 49ers, I think our preseason expectations win 12 games. They yeah. might win 14. Right. And I think it's harder to go from really good to historic like that's a big jump and that's what the 49ers have done with a quarterback coming off of a huge uh elbow injury on who, who top gets of a heat pad every single time he's yeah. on the sideline on his on his elbow no i'm I, what i was saying is I, I i agree with you that we should reframe and refocus how we think about coach of the year i'm also one of these people that doesn't get up in arms about no of sure. the year awards but some right. people do yeah, Some I, it's, it's fun to debate. We have a podcast to debate these things. I just think that the the old formula for coach of the year is kind of like whatever. Because there's there's like five or six guys that can win that type of kind of formula. The Shane Steikens, Sean McVay winning more games. Like every year there's going to be four or five of these coaches that are have a very similar type of uh, profile. And right. I think the, the one that Shanahan's working with is extremely unique. And I think it would be really cool if CMC wins offensive uh, player of the year and yeah. Kyle Shanahan wins coach of the year. I think that would like make sense for what we're watching here. Okay. We're only, you know, 43 minutes into the show, Hayden. If you could, can you name two of the last five coach of the years? Uh, I know that we had Dayball. Did nope. LaFleur win one? Nope. Uh, McVay. Did he sneak one in there? That's six years ago. Okay. Um, man there. I'm trying to go through. Did Dan Campbell win? No, that nope. was Brian Dayball. Uh, man, I'm drawing okay. down here. So it's Dayball last year, Vrabel the year before, Stefanski the year before that. Stefanski won, yeah. John Harbaugh, Matt Nagy, and then we get like the likes of Sean McVay, mm -hmm. Jason Garrett with the Cowboys, Ron Rivera with the Panthers, Bruce Arians with the Cardinals, Ron Rivera again with the Panthers, Bruce Arians again with the Colts. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it, it's about expectations and not the best team each year. Yeah, the Fortnite is beating my expectations. To be I will honest, add, yeah, yeah, for sure. Kyle Shanahan. Well, yeah, I mean, it's insane. So it was Brock Purdy. Um, Kyle Shanahan did win AP Assistant Coach of the Year back in 2016 with Matt Ryan yeah. and the Falcons. I mean, D'Amico Ryan's might win Coach of the Year, and that was a player or a coach that he just lost this offseason. Yeah, I think I think D'Amico would also be very deserving of it too. So, okay, Pittsburgh Steelers. Truly nothing to talk about here, Hayden. Please, please. Kenny I'm, Pickett was a back at practice. The, the the team is in a very rough spot. Um, Deontay Johnson this past week, 4 for 62. George Pickens, there was focus of him giving zero blocking effort for a touchdown that could have been scored. Um, and then we get people from the ex-GM and scouting circles saying like, this was the effort that every team was nervous about for George Pickens coming into the draft. The Steelers obviously thought they could fix it, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I mean, this team is just in purgatory and finding themselves whatever 2024 is going to be. George Pickens learned the lack of blocking from his guy, Deontay Johnson. So here's how you solve wide receiver uh, tantrums and lack of effort. By having a quarterback that can throw them the football and they can have big stats and touchdowns. Well, and we have if, not had that. <laughs> if we rewind it a little bit for the San Francisco 49ers, let's remember year two, 
of Brandon Ayuk not giving blocking effort to the mm-hmm. sufficient degree that Kyle Shanahan wanted and ended up in the doghouse for like the first six games. And now the dude is a dog yep. as a run blocker. Mm-hmm. So it, it is coaching on top of it too. And obviously the yep. coaching aspect on the Steelers has been lacking on the offensive side of the ball. Agree. And then you also can see them, which teams are really giving up on the season. The Steelers right now are 30th in neutral pass rate this month. Uh, they don't believe that they could do it. And then they're completely basically splitting time with Jalen Warren and Najee Harris. So lots of young players on this team. None of them have really developed into like superstars. Philadelphia Eagles, their fan base could not take losing right now. I mean, every single game is an indictment on the entire coaching staff and all the players. Um, there is a thought, and we have been on this wavelength, that obviously – this offense isn't hitting nearly as good as it did last year when they could take off third and fourth quarters, so on and so forth. This year they can't, and it's not even working from quarter one to quarter four. Let's remember Shane Sykin was in charge of this offense last year. He departs. Are you seeing any differences between this year, Eagles, and how they're executing or even trying to execute things versus last year? Everything's just slightly down. So I, I spent a lot of time this morning trying to figure out exactly what it is. They're slightly worse in yards after the catch. Maybe that's like a play calling thing. There's just been fewer like AJ Brown over the middle looks as well. They're slightly worse on the deep passing last game. They were 0 for 4 on their deep targets, two interceptions, uh, the sideline one, and then obviously that huge play by Julian Love. Um, so that's been slightly down. A couple more penalties per game this last week. It was the penalty on the third and one, which would have been a tush push, maybe even touchdown. Now they have to settle for a field goal at that one. But really, Jalen Hurts bailing out of the pockets a little bit more. His scrambling has taken a step back on that knee injury. I think everything else has looked pretty similar. Uh, This team was up and down uh, at parts of the season. But remember, the A.J. Brown stuff in the middle of the year was absolutely going crazy. So I think they've regressed a little bit in every category. I still think this team can get very hot. Um, but yeah, it hasn't not felt as clean, but I think that this is, like you said, Eagles fans a little bit spoiled after what happened last year. It's really hard to repeat what they did last season. So everything coming back a little bit and you start losing a couple games, but I do think if you're pointing a finger, harder schedule, way worse defense, it really, the offense is 10% worse than it was last year. I think that's kind of normal. I think now Eagles fans are like digging into the advanced numbers on what this team is like versus other offenses. And they're pin, some of them are spotlighting, hey, this team doesn't use motion at all when we're seeing obviously the Dolphins and the 49ers. Right. I want to remind you this year, yes, they are 32nd in the league in terms of shift or motion rate um, at like 36%. Mm-hmm. Last year, they were 32nd in the yeah. league at 32%. Yeah. So it's exactly the same. You're out there in 11 personnel because you've got dudes who can win in one-on-one. It's really the execution. But I would, also put, ugh, I would also put on top of it, there is naturally going to be a difference between Shane Sykin and mm-hmm. Brian Johnson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the little details here and there, I think the number, of, it's like there are a full yard fewer in yards after catch per completion this year than what they were last year. So maybe that's where you can kind of dig really deep into some of the the thing, but they ran a pretty stagnant offense last year. To, let's just be honest. Like those, the ground game was elite and the, the deep throws to AJ Brown and isolated coverage are always going to be good. You're going to get some stuff from Dallas Goddard and Devontae Smith as well. It's been a very similar formula. It's just, I think a couple of the wrinkles, but really like the and defense hurts. hurts. Yeah, he's he's been playing hurt, and then his scrambling has taken a hit, and then he bails pockets. But I think yeah. we were really being critical on Jalen Hurts last year. There was also times when he would bail pockets. That's it, what was I just, mean. it was just it was just running a bit more hot last year. A little bit. I, I think the defense just going from really good to pretty bad, if not really bad, this year. That's how you lose these close games. I was also super tilted on Monday night. Uh, I was facing Field Yates, who had Jalen Hurts, and I swear this offense is built to fall down at the one yard line. It is well, like when, when you're facing Jalen Hurts, it stands out so much when they hand the football off inside the 10 yard line yeah. and DeAndre Swift falls down at the one yard line. Over Could you over. believe that? OK, I, I've said that DeAndre Swift is probably like the most overrated running back and people in the comments have yelled at me. I have a bunch of Jalen Hurts, so I, I notice all these details on the flip side of what you're saying. This dude should have way more touchdowns than he has. Um, I'm still tilted that they had called that. Uh, the the Jason Kelsey moving the ball stuff. Uh, 
pretty oh, late. He, he had two rushing scores and like the, the lane and everything was there for DeAndre Swift to just fall into the end zone. And the dude just like goes down to one. There's a force field. For it's crazy situations. Okay. New York jets. Um, I'm not going to pull it up, but you know, Aaron Rodgers on his weekly appearance on Pat McAfee says, Oh, of course I'm not going to return. You know, um, there's more little quotes and details of it, but uh, obviously the Jets have been eliminated from the playoff race. That was always going to be a factor here. Uh, Aaron can also say that he, in the face of modern medicine, uh, did it his own way and was able to practice and uh, potentially be on the field. But anyone who thought, anyone who thought that he could be on the field in week 15 or 16, uh, they were just incorrect. Yeah, take take your L's, everybody. Um, how about this? We don't talk about Aaron Rodgers until week one of next, next year. year. Well, we have to. We 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 do a, a fantasy football times. show with drafts and so sure, sure. we can talk <laughs> about it in the context of fantasy. We will not bring up anything else. Uh, there will be more. Uh, yeah, this team can't block. You know. Yeah. So yeah, I think even if Aaron Rodgers was out there, I think this offense would have been kind of mediocre because this offensive line is just way too injured. They had no answers this last game. I mean, Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson combined for eight expected fantasy points. That's right. how bad things get. We'll see if uh, Zach Wilson could return out of the concussion protocol. Trevor Simeon is certainly not going to get it done. This team can't, can't block. I, I think the other part of this conversation, I do have to bring up Aaron Rodgers' name here, is he is clearly attached to Nathaniel Hackett, Robert Sala, and Joe Douglas. Mm -hmm. Every single Jet supporter out there is irate about Joe Douglas Robert Sala and Nathaniel Hackett for varying differences and, and reasons, right? For Joe Douglas, this guy come comes from Philadelphia, preached the trenches. They did that on the defensive line and that side of the ball, in fact, spent a first round pick on that side of the ball who hasn't played all that much during his rookie year. Meanwhile, the offensive line is total chaos year after year after year. Robert Sala losing record, so on and so forth. And Nathaniel Hackett's offense is the Aaron Rodgers offense. And if you don't have Aaron Rodgers, it's not going to work. But if the dude, number eight, wants those guys back next year, they are going to be back next year. It's really that simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, aside from the owner, he is the one that's calling all the shots in New York. What can go wrong? Quick question. If matchups are what we really care about at times okay. in fantasy football, the New York Jets in week 16, if you somehow advance to this point with Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson, get the Washington Commanders. Okay, I like that for Garrett Wilson. Theory, though, Brees Hall didn't play as much this yeah. last game. They are officially eliminated. Obviously, they had they were trying to have like touch limits with Brees Hall throughout this entire year. Do you think like they want to give Brees Hall 20 meaningless touches at this point by this offensive line? Or do you think that we're going to scale it back? We saw it last week. It's a little bit scaled back of a role for Brees. I think that's a very fair point. Yeah. I think that's a very fair point. Garrett um, Wilson, sure. Let's 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 see what happens. New York Giants. I mainly watched like Darren Waller of this and it still wasn't. I bet you did. <laughs> I mean, four for 40, man. It's, it's grasping at straws here. Um, I mean, they're bad. They're five and nine. They're eliminated. Obviously six points this past week. Uh, it is tough to know. I think on a weekly basis, what you can get out of Tommy DeVito, because in some ways, Hayden, I mean, this might be just a ridiculous comparison, but he has some of that high variance nest that like Sam Howell brings to the table mm -hmm. where he might get sacked nine times, but then also might have four game changing plays. Unfortunately, some of those game changing plays seem less sticky than yes. other game changing plays. Uh, like thinking back to like that Saquon sideline grab, for example. So yeah, I'm with you. Same thing with Saquon Barkley as Brees Hall. Like now that the season is completely tanked, do they start scaling back his workload and stuff? So yeah, Darren Waller, not a full-time player, Hopefully he gets full practices in this week because if he does, maybe I get aggressive enough and make him like the tight end 10 to 12 or something like that. But I would not have a lot of confidence, uh, part-time player, but targets per route run, all that stuff was there for him. Unfortunately, the size of the pie with the Giants is very small. It has been nice to see Andrew Thomas come back in because um, that has stabilized that side of the ball or that side of the line, I should say, a bit more than obviously where it was earlier this season. Evan Neal's been bad for another year. That's that's tough. New Orleans Saints. They're the ones who beat up the New York Giants. I mean, Derek Carr, very efficient. Alvin Kamara was out there a lot. Um, again, Hayden, do you have the snap counts for Rashid Shaheed? Because I know many people expected Rashid Shaheed to be in there 
with Chris Olave missing, it seems like Chris Olave seems destined to play this week. So this yeah. might not matter, but obviously we got a ton of Rashid Shaheed questions uh, in our starts at show on Sunday morning. So Rashid Shaheed pulling it up right now was out there for 25 of 32 dropbacks, which is a little bit more yeah, than definitely. it typically is. Still not a complete full-time player, but the Saints are just distributing the ball to a bunch of players right now. Like Jawan Johnson scores a touchdown. Jimmy Graham is stealing Taysom Hills schemed up touches in the red area. We've seen Jamal Williams pop up for Alvin Kamara a few times right now. So I think like to me, the, the Saints storyline last week was Taysom Hill 12 snaps. Was that because they were absolutely destroying him? Is it because he's coming off of injury? Is it because they love Jimmy Graham even more than Taysom Hill? Who knows exactly what it is, um, but we're we're chopping this thing up into like six or seven guys, and that kind of scares me for everybody. Chris Olave, I need full practices from you, please. The Taysom Hill questions and of the like are probably the ones that I hate the most on Sunday mornings because obviously we have seen him have games where he dominates. I mean, there was a three-game stretch this season, week seven, eight, and nine, 14.8, 22, and 18.6. Mm-hmm. I mean, just... A few weeks ago, he had 14.4. So there have been games this year where he has been a featured focal point of the offense. So your brain jumps to that and say and thinks, especially when a player like Chris Olave goes down and Michael Thomas, oh, that is a possibility. But then you also know that it's Taysom Hill, a positionless player who can also be weaned out of the offense mm-hmm. totally. Mm-hmm. And again, those are... The decisions and the answers that we give on Sunday morning where I sit there and refresh the box scores and watch the games where I'm like, damn, yeah. uh, we either missed or hit on every single one of those, but it could go either way. Yeah, it's a boom bust player. We're not in the meeting rooms, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so maybe Taysom Hill full participant the entire week. Maybe we can get a little bit more confident with him. But yeah, there's always no floor. That's the tight end position just in general. Um, Michael Thomas is able to return, but he's not going to. He's probably out for the season as well. So it'll be Olave, Alvin Kamara, and then I guess we can consider Rashid Shahid and Taysom Hill. But I think at this point, there's just better better options than Taysom Hill, probably. Uh, Trey McBride, those type of guys. Well, yeah. I mean, we're talking, there's... <laughs> <laughs> Real, I mean, there are four teams left. We're talking about good players now. You know, that's that's the thing. There's not, there are going to be fewer... Uh, Travis Kelsey, a uh, be- better option than Taysom Hill. Barely. Sam Laporta, better better option than Taysom Hill. Yeah. Uh, New England Patriots. We're on to 2024, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, look, the talking about Taysom Hill in that conversation, the same thing can kind of be said with Ezekiel Elliott here, where you know you had just insane usage last week. Then this week you're expecting it, and you kind of get it. Yeah. 16 touches, tons of snaps, you know. That though only equals 46 total yards, and that's always a possibility when you're a bad team and you're facing a good team and a good defense. 12 carries, four receptions, and then let's say 33% chance of a touchdown. I think that's like what RB2s are. Um, yeah, they have nobody else to give the ball to right now except Hunter Henry in the in the red zone. That's a lot of touchdowns all of a sudden for around 18 picks. So hopefully he's helped you guys out there. Pop Douglas didn't do enough. Bailey Zappi, uh, even, I would say even worse than Mac Jones as a whole. So yeah, this team is watching so much Caleb Williams and Drake may uh, tape right now. The good news is they will not have to make that selection. Uh, the bears will, and they'll take the leftovers and we'll ride into the future there. Miami dolphins. Oh, speaking of Drake may Christmas week episode of scheme with Colt McCoy. We're actually recording it tomorrow. I still tonight need to watch the game, but we're going to have a Drake may video first up of the draft series of these quarterbacks singular contest we are focusing on people say he's justin herbert like i can't wait to dive in okay miami dolphins 30 points i talked about it um they get the dallas cowboys defense next week which just got ran all over by the buffalo bills so that brings us to raheem mostert who has 20 touchdowns this season and also brings us to devon achan who hayden looks super explosive and even in a game where they didn't need to give him it, he still got 12 touches. And to me, that suggests that he is healthy. And that means for all of you that have him on your semifinal rosters, I'm playing Devon HN next week. 
I think you should as well. He's going to be somewhere in my upside RB2 conversation. It is very clear, though, that Raheem is the goal line back. He had all yep. five of the inside the five yard line opportunities. He had two touchdowns last week. It easily could have been a third, if not a fourth one as well. That's just where the Dolphins are at. I thought the offensive line held up better than expected this last game. And then obviously Tua hits Jalen Waddle on that deep play. Jalen Waddle's usage was the highest it was since week eight without Tyreek Hill. We'll see. It sounds like Tyreek Hill is going to be back this week uh, in a more difficult matchup. I think Tyreek Hill and the Dolphins knew they were going to beat the Jets by a million. So I'm <laughs> sure that's why they're just being uh, precautious with him. And yeah, I thought everything looked the same except Devon Achan, instead of scoring a 60 yard touchdown, they were 10 yard gains, which is just regression. Yeah. I mean, to me, the reason why they might have felt that they could get away with not having Tyreek Hill, unless he, you know, really obviously did keep himself out, is because they felt confident in their defense versus the Jets' offense. Yeah. Like the Jets' defense can have games. We saw it the week before, too. But um, yeah, man, this is a uh, explosive team, a very, very fun team that the rest of the way gets some fun matchups. And I can't wait to see them. Cowboys, Ravens, Bills. I will say this about the Dolphins. This defense is becoming really yep. good since like week seven, eight, once they That's got Jalen Fangio back. style. Ooh. I mean, we're talking about Bradley Chubb had a huge game this last yep. game, edge rusher. They have Jalen Ramsey when healthy. They have stud safeties and you have Vic Fangio, who's probably still top five defensive coordinator. That's the formula with a very good offense. I know they haven't beaten anybody. I've been very critical of the Dolphins on this show at times, but to me, explosive offense, a defense that is trending in the right direction to me for reasons. I think are sticky defensive coordinator, superstar corner. I mean, who Jalen Ramsey completely shut out Garrett Wilson. Yeah. And we've seen Jalen Ramsey play multiple spots. Um, obviously with the Rams, he was more of that star or mm -hmm. inside player about 50% of the time. Uh, now he is vast majority of snaps, if not all of them on the outside and he can still do it. He can yeah. still do it. It makes sense that, again, second half of the season, him coming back has helped. Also, Fangio defenses just in the second half of seasons plus playoffs seem to gel yep. a bit more. Yep. And we are here with them. Okay. Rams from Los Angeles. Get in the playoffs, please. Please, please, please. Um, this is the opposite of the conversation. Obviously, we had with the Atlanta Falcons, Kyron Williams, again, two fumbles, but still goes out there for, you know, a cool 32 opportunities uh spinning catches run after catch wide open stuff for cooper cup including that 62 yarder and then you know puka still making plays man i mean I, for dynasty startups this offseason i know this isn't our realm hayden yeah but i think people are going to i mean obviously adp adp is going to settle somewhere but be all over, all over the map in terms of like the upside of what puka nakua brings to the table um, my thoughts on it is he's clearly talented. He is a super physical player. He meshes extremely well with Matthew Stafford, um, who will fire passes in there in awkward angles and difficult spots. Um, I'm not saying he will regress when a lesser quarterback is out there, but at the same time, it feels like last week plus this week, we're getting top five quarterback stuff for Matthew Stafford. I would call him a top five quarterback right now with all the the injuries. Uh, he's slinging the ball like crazy. I've done an offseason research. Matthew Stafford's contract is not going anywhere. So that dynasty question is for at least 2025 and beyond. We'll have Matthew Stafford back. And I haven't seen signs that Matthew Stafford is aging. Like it's not just his arm strength and all that stuff. Obviously, he's going to be able to read defenses. He still looks fairly agile out there. So I'm with you. Puka is going to be an absolute stud. I think he's by far the best wide receiver uh, in this class, uh, just watching the tape on top of the production that he's had. And then, yeah, Kyron Williams um, ran the models. He's averaging five more expected points than any other player uh, aside from the quarterbacks. I mean, that includes Dom, Chris McCaffrey, five, and Tyree more, Hill. five more in this last month, five wow. more than anybody else, including the fumbles. Reminder, those fumbles came in on the other side of the 50 yard line. Those were going to be touchdowns. This Rams offense is putting up like top five numbers now that they have Matthew Stafford. They were yeah. number two in projected points going into last week. I would not expect, or I would not be surprised if they were top three, top five for the rest of the way. This team is a playoff team and a threatening one at that. We are already, 
going to have, you know, plenty of content until the NFL playoffs start. Maybe one piece of content we make early in the playoffs is without rookies, or maybe we include rookies doing a mock redraft for the The 2024 season. Mm -hmm. And because players like Puka and Kyron, who weren't even close or even being drafted at all heading into this year are going to be top three round picks at worst heading into next year. You know, I mean, how is Kyron not going to be a first round pick next year? Right. That's what I mean. But then obviously Puka included in that. So trying to gauge of where that ADP is going to fall could be a really fun exercise. Mm -hmm. Down, down for that. Uh, Also Cooper cup this month, wide receiver 10 on wide receiver 16 usage. He looks healthier now. There's a couple games in there where, I was very nervous about his yards after the catch was kind of stumbling and all that stuff. He's looked pretty, pretty good. It's been multiple weeks since he's had those injuries now. So I, I would not, I wouldn't be surprised if I have him inside my top 10 again. Yeah. Let us know in the comments if you'd be interested in like an early look for a mock draft of a fantasy football league for 2024. Okay. Chargers. Keenan Allen still isn't practicing. Uh, missed him in one league. I doubt he plays if Justin Herbert's playing. I mean, not playing. I mean, could you? Would you blame him? <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's 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 nothing good here. Um, Austin Eckler's. There's no reason for the Chargers to kind of trot him out e- either. He's an expiring contract. They've tried to get Isaiah Spiller and Josh Kelly going a little bit. Uh, I did not think that Easton Stick played all that good. It's this team's going to be projected for like. 15 points for the rest of the season. And I'm not sure if there's a single player that we must start. I guess Josh Palmer went absolutely nuts. But that was a long 79 yarder. Yeah, but you just, you can't trust it. Same thing with Gerald Everett. This team might not have, actually, I'll say this. If you are starting one of these chargers in your semifinals, things are not looking good for you. Yeah. Easton stick had one of those performances that like are drastically different in comparison from QBR to quarterback rating, because obviously he threw for two fifty seven and three touchdowns. So the rating is going to give him 114 versus QBR was below 30. And I'm Definitely. with you, like really the first 10 dropbacks were abysmal. Yeah. And then he kind of not got lucky, but they were obviously down like 60 points. <laughs> and so you can throw three touchdowns in that environment. Six down 60 points per sources. <laughs> wow. Okay. Speaking of the Raiders were up 60 points. It felt like I haven't seen anything about Josh Jacobs yet. I'll search on the Twitter sphere right now, but again, in his absence, it was 17 carries for 69 yards and a touchdown for Zamir white to go along with three receptions and 16 yards. Yeah, I think Zamir White did exactly what we needed him to do there. Uh, A relative bell cow. He's definitely in the RB2 mix. Uh, I don't trust this Raiders team to put up a bunch of points. Very inconsistent with Aiden O'Connell. But Zamir White, we have the answer. He's going to be the goal line back. Um, It was cool to watch that Raiders team with all the trick plays. I mean, it was a no mercy performance uh, against their rival as well. So that was that was fun to watch. Uh, Devontae Adams, he's the wide receiver 12 in usage. Jacoby Myers, wide receiver 48 in usage. Michael Mayer scores a touchdown. Um, yeah, I think we know the ball is going to the running back and Devontae Adams. I, I don't trust Jacoby Myers still. And look, these two teams that we just spoke about have both fired their head coach in season, but they're very different in how they're handling it. You know, whoever has stepped in on Brandon Staley's job is not going to be in the thought process for the head coach in 2024. Meanwhile, Antonio Pierce is. And so the dude wants to get his guys amped. He wants to actually try to put points on the board. He wants to try to win at all costs and like show off. And so to me, this is a much bigger trust factor of playing these guys among the fired coaches of America in the National Football League, right? (laughs) Fired coaches of America, a hell of a union. Kansas City Chiefs. I believe Isaiah Pacheco is probably back in our lives this yep. week. So that means uh, we will not have CEH elevating eight feet off the ground for touchdown grabs next week. Unless something, <laughs> unless something miraculous happens, Aiden. I couldn't believe he jumped that high. That was wild. Of course, Jarek McKinnon, he gets the uh, the goal line pass in passing touchdown with the trickeration there. It was CEH on early downs. Jarek McKinnon mixes in for all the other stuff. I think the big storyline here, I mean, Rasheed Rice, post by rookie bump, 
wide receiver six on wide receiver eight usage this month. They need him out there. They place Sky Moore on injured reserve. Uh, Kadarius Tony is a walking INT off of his own hand. So there's two guys they can trust right now. It's Travis Kelsey, who's very clearly not the same player. He's still very good, um, but the yards after the catch and contested catches have not been hitting the same for Travis Kelsey. So they need Rasheed Rice to be the guy, and it helps when you get looks like that one. Yeah, I wonder, because we really haven't seen it this year, the manufactured touches near the goal line with jet sweeps and stuff, like we got to Miko Harbin like three against the 49ers last year, and obviously Kadarius Toney and Sky Moore in the Super Bowl. Um, I don't think Rasheed Rice is that type of player, but obviously we saw that shovel pass for a touchdown, which is yeah. along the same lines. They, I think they said that Richie James needs to get more oh, snaps great. as well. So I mean, that's a guy that can do that type of stuff. Uh, we'll see. Andy Reid seems to like Kadarius Tony, at least publicly speaking, because there's been ample opportunities to absolutely grill him in press conferences, and they still say that they like Kadarius. They want him to be out there and stuff. They just don't have any, any other bodies. No Sky Moore out there. Like they need some of these manufactured touches. So uh, not that it matters for fantasy. Uh, yeah. I, Patrick Mahomes has to be so frustrated. Some of these interceptions and stuff. Like it's right. it's it's ridiculous that he's not even in the MVP conversation because what he's doing. If most quarterbacks had this skill group of players, they would be absolutely going nuts at all times. And Mahomes has composed composed himself other than the one glimpse uh, last week. Yeah, Mahomes played really well this past week, despite you know twenty seven of thirty seven, two interceptions, three sacks, all that type of stuff that that you'll see out there. Um, quick thing, Rasheed Rice. Even dating back to week one with Steve Smith, you know, you had conversations of like, what the heck is going on? These guys are running into each other. That lasted for weeks. I mean, weeks, even this past week. Again, cool. Kadarius Tony bounced interception off his hands. So, like, the trust factor just hasn't been there with these wide receivers. Yeah. And it's very clear that the one guy that he has trusted now is Rasheed Rice, up to what, like 92% of snaps. Mm -hmm. And so it's still not tons of big boy routes out there. True. But that's fine. If you're still getting manufactured stuff and playing 92 percent and you have the run after catch capabilities and an offense that is starting to score maybe a few more points now like that is obviously good enough for top 12 wide receiver stuff right now yeah he's gonna be right there on the border uh and it's not going anywhere uh by the way wild guess where do you think uh the chiefs are in epa on their screens this year screens just screens screens i mean I would say not good because of the players. I'm not looking at it. I'm okay. not looking at it. Okay. No but spoilers. but Andy Reid is insane with screes. So I would say high based on that. Like it's not because of the personnel. It's because of the play caller that they rank good. They are number two on the per play, and they're number one in total EPA on it. And like that's just like Andy Reid, absolutely saving this team with Patrick Mahomes. Like those two guys are keeping this offensive. They're still top 10 in all every single offensive number. They're still top 10 in them, which is crazy given how bad the skill group is. So the screens have been a huge impact uh, for the chiefs. Yeah. I mean, Andy in the screen game that he had all the way back in Philadelphia. Uh, I am on record for multiple years saying teams are either fantastic at screens or abysmal on screens because when oh, they're yeah. good, like Kevin Stefanski, for example, it stands out. And when it goes really poorly, where an offensive lineman can't get out or all the rhythm and the timing of it is off, that really stands out as well. There's a certain team I don't want to uh, give a spoiler that I had to look up the, this wide receiver screens because they were so bad at it. I just looked as a whole this year, wide receiver screens on first and second down because I wanted to remove like third in a million screens. Right. Negative EPA, a 42% success rate. That's basically the Bears and Cardinals passing offense. So these wide receiver screen teams are usually terrible. Shanahan's amazing at it. Andy Reid's amazing at it. Everybody else basically is awful. So when you see a wide receiver screen, just know it is a bad play. It's not like you imagine this. They never work. Well, maybe that team is the next one up for us. It's the Jacksonville Jaguars. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Give it to me. They've ran the most uh, screens in the NFL, 80 of them. The league average about 52. They have a negative 0.2 EPA, which is like awful passes. They they just really cannot figure out the wide receiver screens, the running back screens. The timing of the offense seems whack. They've had interceptions. They've had drops on screens. 
They keep trying it, though, and that, to me, has been one of the downfalls for Jacksonville. The ground game has been bad, and the screen game has been bad, and then you're forcing Trevor Lawrence to try to make these throws down the field, and a lot of them are on third and tens and that, those type of throws where the only option is sideline bombs where Calvin Ridley is 50-50 to get his feet in. So it's been a really tough offense to watch, super frustrating. I think they're putting Trevor Lawrence in really bad spots, and then this last game... I thought Trevor Lawrence's accuracy was all over the place. And yep. that's kind of been an up and down thing. I think maybe as a prospect, that's the one area where I've been a little bit disappointed that like, oh, maybe he has, he has like, a sale on him though at Clemson too. For sure. But you're thinking like, okay, this generational prospect, like he has elite arm, arm talent. I would say he has good arm talent and he's super headsy and that keeps him afloat and still obviously very athletic. But there's some, some games where obviously this game had a little bit of wind and whatnot in this, but Balls get away from them every every yeah, once yeah. in a while. Um, I remember first videos on this channel was with JTO Sullivan. We were talking about, you know, the because mm -hmm. that was Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson and Justin Fields. I mean, that feels like forever ago, sir. Yeah. Um God, was that awful? Was that also um no, it wasn't. That was that was the next year. Anyways. Um look at this. Jaguars, second highest percentage of rushes that go for one yard or less. It's not going to work one yard or less. Uh, we had some great moments from Travis Etienne this season. That feels like it has totally shriveled up and died. Uh, I do not want to have like the Trevor Lawrence discourse again, though. Like I already lived through through the length of this channel of, oh, he's a bust and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that first year, obviously, it's abysmal. He inherited an awful team. It was made worse by Urban Meyer. Um, things obviously were better in year two. But even Doug Peterson went out there and said that, look, we basically have to reset and everything. I wonder if bits and pieces of it this year is that, you know, Doug Peterson is no longer the play caller. But at times, like, you know, Doug Peterson was just fired by the Philadelphia Eagles, too. Like, that offense can get stale at times. And as you're saying, it's not all in all the other pieces. Like, Trevor goes through these peaks and valleys. And, yeah. you know, a couple of years ago, it was mainly trying to force passes inside the red zone and needless turnovers yep. in that area. So I am of the opinion that I think Trevor Lawrence is still a very good quarterback. I think that the expectations of this is the best since Andrew Luck are right. getting in his way a lot in the public discourse. I would say he's like right on like the top 10 quarterback range. And I think people have bad expectations with prospects. You can be a generational prospect, one of the best prospects ever. And that does not mean you're going to be the best quarterback in the NFL. That just means you have the highest odds of being a very good quarterback, which he is. I think that sometimes expectations get a little bit out of control. Uh, right now, they're they're running into problems just because Zay Jones pulls up lame on that go route. Uh, he has a hamstring injury. It's called week to week. Uh, they're not going to get Christian Kirk back either. So it's Calvin Ridley and Parker Washington. Calvin Ridley obviously had almost a touchdown uh, in there on that deflected reps, pass. I mean, reps. get together. Yeah, we're gonna have to. We decide. need one. We're gonna have to decide. Um, but yeah, Calvin Ridley, number one, number one in wide receiver usage just last week, busted for the third week in a row. Uh, right now, I, I just had it up on the screen, so I'm not sure if you saw it. Calvin Ridley, wide receiver 40 in production this month, wide receiver three overall in usage. It has certainly felt like that. We'll see if uh, Trevor Lawrence is gonna play on the through the concussion protocol. Um, Oh, yeah, because that, that was post-game. That was, that was post-game. Game. Typically, it's like 30% kind of return. Uh, there wasn't like some vicious hit that we saw where he's like very clearly unconscious. That's not even how concussions work, so I don't even know why I'm talking about that. We'll see if he plays in this one. Uh, that division is up for grabs officially yep. with the Colts and Texans. Eight and six, the Jaguars are right now, uh, and it's a decent run. I mean, they have the hot Tampa Bay Buccaneers, then the uh, Panthers and the Titans. Close it up. Okay, Indianapolis Colts also in the hunt. They're also eight and six. Sounds like Zach Moss is going to play. He wants to play. Hayden, pour one out for what could have been or still might be your week 16. Trey Sermon is the one you need to take. Very close to pulling this one off. Uh, did not have enough good karma this year, I guess, to get it back. Jonathan Taylor is expected to return possibly here as well i need that so bad 
Yeah, we'll see. Um, coming off of injury, Zach Moss is very clearly in the mix. We've seen Jonathan Taylor and Zach Moss split time, so I'm not sure exactly what the rotation is going to be based off of health. I'll be looking for full partis- participants. Just as important, if not bigger news, Michael Pittman takes that vicious hit. Uh, the Steelers player is suspended because of it. Michael Pittman in concussion protocol, probably not going to play in this one. It's about 25, 30% for those guys. So we'll see. Could we get, it's been a while since we've talked about Josh down in a positive yeah, but, light. But they, they play very different roles for this team. Right. Um, do you know, the interesting part is we also got Isaiah McKenzie suspended for the next three games, like the rest of the season for conduct de- conduct detrimental to the team. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he and Josh downs have been the lateral spread you out uh, sideways. and they don't have anyone like Michael Pittman that can thrive in terms of big body, make those difficult catches in short to intermediate areas. A lot of Michael Pittman's production has been off of the RPOs where it's first read. Could Josh Downs be in a spot where he can still take advantage of some of those looks where the just the back side of it, instead of it typically being Michael Pittman, could we get Josh Downs in that role? I'm not sure if you want like DJ Al- Montgomery. Well, him or, you know, like a lot of these RPOs, it's attached with a glance or a slant route. Right. Alec Pierce on those routes. No. I mean, I think can't. Alec Pierce is stuck into the right. vertical clear out guy and he, he can't do anything else. So I don't I don't want us to right. or anyone out there to elevate. And maybe this comes back to bite me, but I don't think they're going to ask Alec Pierce to run short stuff. And that's why I do think if, if Pittman does miss some of these RPO first read looks could go to Josh Downs just because I think that the type of throws those typically are attached to is where they can move Josh Downs alignment a little bit and maybe give him some extra looks. It's just been a little bit since we've talked about Josh Downs. We also see a bunch of tight ends get run from them too. You know, three were involved in Mo Ali Cox, Kylan Granson, Drew Ogletree. So like this is galaxy brain. Wouldn't be shocked if like Kylan Granson moves into sure. kind of that big body. And look, Josh Downs plays much bigger than his size. Mm-hmm. He did back at UNC. So maybe he could do some of that stuff, but um, that would be changing his position in some ways too. I mean, it's just the reason why I have to have this conversation, the Colts right now are first in neutral pass rate this month. Totally. So like these type of throws happen at a high enough cliff where it definitely does matter for fantasy purposes. Another theory, Michael Pittman removed from the offense. Gardner Minshew just turns into a pumpkin. Like very much this just could be a, a really low team total if Michael Pittman's not out there. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Okay, Houston Texans. Big comeback win for them. I think CJ Stroud is still in the concussion protocol. Um, those around the team reporters seem like it's uncertain if he yeah. is going to exit it. Obviously, it was a massive hit that he took against the New York Jets. In his absence, we did see Devin Singletary get 30 touches. 30 touches. Wild. And then, again, Noah Brown against lesser corners of the Tennessee Titans played at a very high level, I thought. So Devin Singletary, let's start with him. 21.7 expected points. We've seen Damian Pierce be in the mix, out of the mix. He was very out of the mix this last game. Devin Singletary also had that touchdown called back. That would have been a walk-off long game. Dare I say Singletary looks like totally fine this year. Um, It's been a a new role for him, a new offense, and he's looked really good. So I think that it will be Devin Singletary. Obviously, if it's C.J. Stroud, the team total will be significantly higher where I would rank Devin Singletary very high. Um, if it is uh, the backup situation, Keenan Mills um, less bullish. And the same thing with Nico Collins. Nico Collins missed one week the last time he had this calf injury. That would be him returning this week, but it is the second time doing this. So I think it's just like too early in the week to have like concrete takes, except that shout out to Domenico Ryan for, I mean, pulling this win off with all of his best players not out there. I mean, literally yeah. the four best players on the team, Stroud, Will Anderson, Collins, Tink Dell, and Larry Mutunsel. Four of the five, not even in, and they still win. Wow. Yeah. Derek Stanley stepped up. Jonathan Grenard stepped up. Malik Collins stepped up. Um, and now, Hayden, they do face the Cleveland Browns this week. So yeah. big defensive change, obviously. And even when we saw CJ Stroud without, you know, Nico Collins and without Tank Dell against a really good caliber defense. Granted, it was an elements. Um, the offense just did not perform well against the New York Jets. Mm-hmm. I wonder what the outcome, if it's Case Keenum, plus that. Like Again, Noah Brown has made some incredible plays this year, some one-off, exceptional catch-and-run stuff. But there's a difference when trying to separate from Sauce Gardner. There's a difference than when you're trying to separate 
against the Tennessee Titans. And then now when you get the Cleveland Browns and their outside corners too. Right now, the Browns, uh, they're going to be in Houston. The Browns are favored to win, which is probably not a good sign for Stroud's availability. We shall see. Denver Broncos. Um, Hayden, I have no notes for this team. I got to be honest with you. Same. Let's just be honest. It's It was not a good performance from them the last time. Uh, running through the numbers, it's same thing with Javante. Kind of up and down season. It's been pretty rough for him. Uh, recently, uh, Cortland Sun separated from Jerry Judy, but yeah, we'll we'll see what they do with Russell Wilson. Um, now that they're more or less out of the playoff hunt, do they want to risk Russell Wilson's injury status? Uh, for those just kind of curious, real quick, going into this offseason, if he's on the roster like a week after the this offseason kicks off, then his guaranteed money kicks in into 2025. So they're gonna be making a decision on Russell Wilson, not just for 2024, but also for 2025. They have like a season ahead escalator. I think he's kind of been right on the periphery of if you want Russell Wilson to be the answer or not. I don't want to read into this too much. I am because that's what we do in the show. They were down 21, nothing at half. They still ran the ball 28 times and had 32 passing attempts. Like granted, tw- seven of those 28 runs were Russell Wilson scrambles or design runs, whatever. But to me, again, it outlines how the team wants to play offense, yeah. and it's not throw the ball 45 times with Joe Flacco. Yeah, I agree. I, if I had to guess, I think that the Broncos will kind of fizzle away, and then they'll reset. They'll get rid of Russell Wilson. Uh, they'll take a bunch of dead money over the next couple of years and then try to find a younger quarterback. So we'll see but if like, they get Jared Sidham for like week 18. Again, we, we can say that after what, one and seven start or whatever, it was one and five start. Meanwhile, like it's been fun to watch Russell Wilson at times with those moments of magic and obviously kind of incorporating himself in the Sean Payton offense. I will say like obviously Jerry Judy is um, gone after this year. Cortland Sutton, they would save $10 million by moving on this offseason. I don't know if they would. I think you have to keep him even though he's going to count. I think Judy's back. I think Judy's back for the next year because they, they locked in the fifth year option for next year, this right. off season. He completely busted. So right. the funny thing about Jerry yeah. Judy is he had that early 40 yard catch and my mind instantly went to the pick lobby where he's always at 42 and a half receiving. Yard. Yeah, it's, it's been tough. Um, yeah, I, I think we'll, I think the Broncos should reset here. Oh, by the way, the Broncos defense, this last game, the middle of the field. I mean, there was nobody, I mean, Amon Ra, Jameer Gibbs, the linebackers and safeties, like, this team needs more depth, and I think that keeping Russell Wilson's huge contract is not the best way. Yeah. Um, I mean, to your point, though, of who they're going to keep and stuff, they have to cut people. They are $17 million over the cap right now. Mm-hmm. Now, you can cut, wave injured, probably Tim Patrick coming off an injury that saved you $10 million. DJ Jones saves you $10 million. Garrett Bowles saves you sixteen. You know, you can restructure some of these people, too. Um, some decisions have to be made. Get rid of Russ. <laughs> well, <laughs> that hurts you in money. I know, but you gotta you gotta get serious for moving forward. I mean, locking him in now for the next two years that's that's risque. I just don't even know if like cap wise can't. I guess they can get rid of Russ, but then you have to get rid of even more people on top of that. Yeah. Um, Anyways, we'll we'll talk about that in the offseason. Yeah. We'll talk about that in the offseason. Dallas Cowboys. I mean, the first bad week. Of course, it happens in the first round of the fantasy playoffs where Dak Prescott gets you less than 10 points. What did you see when you watched this offense? Cause I know you had a great thread about it. Yeah. So just shout out to the bills, lots of pre-snap changes to post-snap single high to uh, two high defenses, changing things up right when they were throwing Dak Prescott off the scent with the zone stuff. Then they had a series where they went to two man and they were shutting the, the wide receivers and Jake Ferguson out on those ones, Dak Prescott missed a big post route to Brandon Cooks, just overthrew him to start the game. Then all of a sudden, things were spiraling. So uh, the Bills were just really smart with the way that they were attacking them. Then they finally had a simulated pressure and stuff. So I thought Dak Prescott uh, was spooked at times. I thought his wide receivers uh, were pretty bad, too. A couple bad reps, uh, reps from Jalen Tolbert and Brandon Cooks. But Dak Prescott usually has the answers to the test just didn't have them in this one by the time things got out of hand. So a little bit more Rico Dowdle in this one. Didn't get CeeDee Lamb going enough. 
Um, and then a couple garbage time completions to kind of save some of the days for Lamb and Ferguson. But really, I just thought that the Bills game plan against uh, Dak Prescott was very good. And a lot of it was just because Sean McDermott was changing the looks uh, up post snap. Yeah, I just hope this isn't back to back weeks. Obviously, they're on the road again this week in Miami. And we talked about that defense. We talked about the offense and how the rushing game is probably going to be successful against this Cowboys defense. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. We will see. Cleveland Browns. Let's do it. I mean, it is the Joe Flacco era in <laughs> Cleveland. I mean, for real. It really is. <laughs> I, I will make a statement that might sound outlandish. Um, Hayden, it is so clear that Kevin Stefanski feels he can call all the passing plays with Joe Flacco. And it's very clear that he didn't feel like he could do that with any other quarterback no. that worked in with the team this year. I believe Deshaun Watson has a $64 million cap hit <laughs> next offseason. Uh, I would not be surprised if they try to get Joe Flacco back on the roster. I agree with you. They're just like letting it bombs away. It's not always pretty with Joe Flacco. Certainly Three not. Bad, and those were kind of early, and some of them were mm -hmm. awful targets. But at the same time, dude, we saw some out-of-structure goodness from Joe Flacco. The dude can move mm -hmm. for his age, and that elite off-script long completion to Amari Cooper was incredible stuff. Yeah, he doesn't look like he's 38 or whatever, which is shocking to me. And by the way, just to put more context around this performance, they are losing more offensive linemen in Cleveland. We're talking about like four of the better offensive linemen in the whole league are not even available, throw in the Nick Chubb stuff, of course. And they're not even like trying to run the ball anymore. They're number two in neutral pass rate. It's all Joe Flacco. And a lot of these are either deep routes to like Amari Cooper or scheming up David and Joku I mean repeatedly over and over again but I am with you it seems like there's like a freedom right yes. now in this offense uh with Joe Flacco who after the game said he wants to play next year feels like he has the juice and right now he does have the juice I think it's a freedom from the quarterback realizing like hey I got nothing to lose mm -hmm. and as you said it's a freedom in the play caller again 44 pass attempts we saw you know, 44 <laughs> previously we've seen 45 this was a close game. I mean, they were down 17 to seven entering the fourth quarter, but like, again, neutral pass rate. Yeah. They are throwing it a lot. And that is so different than again, the Baker Mayfield era that we saw from Kevin Stefanski. And that was very different than the Deshaun Watson pre-injury post-injury stuff that we saw this year too. Yeah. This is just a compilation of the David and Joku targets. And there are a lot of them. And he makes plays yeah. like that one. He's absolute freak right now. He's the, Tight end two in usage this month. So he's been the one that's completely taken off with Joe Flacco. Um, he's a top five guy for me in my initial fantasy rankings. And Amari Cooper, wide receiver 21 usage. Elijah Moore, I don't think he's very good, but he's wide receiver 25 in usage this month. Um, and yeah, I guess other news on the inverse of this, Jerome Ford running back 28 uh, in usage, still losing the goal line role. So I, I wouldn't say he's a must start anymore just because they're getting insane play from Flacco. Insane volume. Okay. Cincinnati Bengals episode of scheme on the channel right now. And it's actually one of my favorites. Go and watch it. Um, it's about Jake Browning and it's, it's, I won't ruin the whole thing, but asking just psychologically a quarterback who has just been sitting there who the offense is built around the different dude and you're ice cold to then come into a game, a season, a team and magically turn hot. Your brain must be effed, but then also just trying to catch up on the fly with all of it. So it's very cool to watch this team and how Zach Taylor is adjusting and how, again, there are so many plays every single week. We've shown you a few today that it can work one out of 10 times. And for Jake Browning, it feels like those one out of 10 are hitting kind of consecutively. <laughs> yeah. That last game, just how much the Vikings threw at them and for him yes. to handle that just shows how polished he is for an inexperienced quarterback. I think his fundamentals are always strong. He seems like he definitely knows where he's going. I just looked at this. This is just like where the quarterbacks are throwing the ball. And uh, Joe Burrow was obviously peppering that kind of like five to 10 yard window. Uh, Jake Browning is just letting it rip a couple more times down the sideline than what Joe Burrow was doing. And he is getting away with it right now. The 
the, the one the T Higgins touchdown was I mean absolutely ludicrous and we needed one of those it's been a while since T Higgins was in our lives but how he caught that ball and then reached it out for uh score all these sideline plays are good so yeah Jake Browning a little bit more arm talent than probably what most teams were expecting and was able to handle a lot of chaos uh with Brian Flores yeah, that's a good way of putting it because we talk about every week Brian Flores will confuse you what he shows you pre-snap is not what you're getting post-snap and so there are times where Jake Browning has to play quick and then there are other times when it looks like he is sending seven and then drops and it's like a drop eight and so then you instantly have to turn your brain to playing slow and Browning was able to do that in both regards and then hit open areas whole shots the like um it's sweet I mean this T Higgins play here what is this I mean, it's it's a no look. Just watch Jake Browning and how he he does like a loop de loop when he throws this. He doesn't even look at it. He he turns away. It's a prayer, and then the go go gadget <laughs> arm to put it over the pylon. Insane. That was wild. Um, yeah. The the Vikings. This is a perfect rep right here. They're number one, and when they're bringing seven, eight, nine defenders, and then they're also number one in drop eight coverages. Like you better have your shit together, and Jake Browning definitely has his shit together. And look, I. There have been times in the past, and maybe it's because press conferences and whatever, where I've asked, like, who is Zach Taylor? Like, what really is he? I think this is a perfect example of it, you know, like being able to get someone this prepared. I don't want to take anything yeah. away from Jake Browning with it, but changing your offense in somewhat certain ways. And mm -hmm. it's also, Hayden, even those swings and screens and stuff at the line of scrimmage, like Chase Brown is exceptional with those mm -hmm. right now. Chase Brown's got a little bit of Ty Chandler to him, like the – the athletic ability kind of pops. Well, There's probably going to go way earlier than round 18 next year. The oh community is going to fall in love with Chase Brown. It's, it's definitely facts. And then, well, okay. Yeah. Where, where do you think just early on and who knows how the all season goes, but prediction time, it is December 19th. Yeah. Do we think Chase Brown is higher or lower than round 13 and a half? Uh, he's going around about nine, kind of the Rashad White range. I think kind of that <laughs> mix. Yeah, because Joe Mixon's gonna gonna get cut most likely. Um, and yeah, they're, they're, and so they're it's, it's all just gonna be shoved onto Chase Brown in the people's eyes. Yeah, Travion's gone. Um, Samaje's obviously gone. It's gonna be Chase Brown and whatever other rookies they bring in. There it is. Okay, three more teams. Chicago Bears. I actually did not have a chance to watch the Bears, and I'm going to do it later tonight. Um, the biggest, I think, revelation, if you want to put it that way, is after Deontay Foreman owned the backfield last week, Deontay Foreman did not own the backfield this week, and it was split. Six carries to Foreman, six carries to Herbert, five carries to Roshan, plus four catches to Roshan, one for Herbert, and none for Deontay Foreman. And Deontay Foreman had the goal line opportunities, but finished with negative yards. And then after that, Roshan is mixing in with the passing situations. And then kind of Khalil Her Herbert and Foreman are rotating drives. Three running backs is never a good situation. The Bears offense is not good enough to warrant any of these guys in the semifinals. Yeah. I mean, it's such a change. Like, look, all we can try to predict is what teams put out there. And let's remember, just the week before, when they beat the Detroit Lions, 28-13, Deontay Foreman owned the backfield. He had 11 carries compared mm -hmm. to four combined for Cleo Herbert and Roshan Johnson. He also had two catches with none of the other backs having mm -hmm. one. So, like, we try to do this. We try to predict the future. Uh, it's just that predictions are hard, especially when they are about the future. Yes, and then it obviously didn't help facing Cleveland in Cleveland, Justin Fields. He only took three sacks on 43 dropbacks. That's very impressive, uh, but had the interceptions, which were completely not his fault, uh, but also completed less than half of his snaps. So just it's, ask, it's asking a lot for Justin Fields to go get up against Cleveland. Carolina Panthers, um, they are utilizing Chuba Hubbard to the nth degree. I think this team... Uh, also, weather plays a part in this, as we saw on the Atlanta sideline, too. Um, I think they realize that they are having difficulty, uh, other than the final drive, creating passing plays. And so almost in a vein of last year, uh, hey, let's try to run the football a lot. And that's giving us a lot of Chuba Hubbard production. 
Chuba is the running back five in usage this month. So yes. I mean, it is very real. Um, RB9 in production over that span. And yeah, you nailed it. They are dead last in usual pass rate, 38% this month, which is even lower than the Falcons, Steelers, Cardinals, those type of teams. So yeah. they just have no other answers. Uh, Amir Smith Marset is the new Visca. Adam Thielen can't get open. Jonathan Mingo can't, op- can't get open. TJ Chart can't get open or catch the ball. It's tough. And I think I think part of that in the last month is that they've had two weather games. You know, the Bucks was a weather game. Obviously, the Falcons one was a weather game on top of it. So obviously you lean into the running game. But again, that's where they're being successful here in in this moment. They have the Packers, the Jaguars, and the uh and the Buccaneers to try to escape a top two overall pick. They they will not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll close that with the Arizona Cardinals. Um, Trey McBride, fantastic. Ooh. This is another one of those teams we talked about on um, Instant Reaction Show on Sunday night, where the 49ers were missing both their starting defensive tackles. So the Arizona Cardinals decided to run the ball a ton. It was effective early. Um, I do not think that that means they translate that into their weekly game plan moving forward. James Conner's been good enough to handle things like that if they wanted to go with that type of game script. I think it will depend if Marquise Brown is able to play, left the game early again with the heel injury. Hopefully they just like let him you know, heal. That would be a start. In the meantime, Trey McBride, absolute legend out there. Will we, When will the next time we'll see Trey McBride higher, lower, three first downs uh, mm-hmm. in the pick and lobby? It might be years and years. This guy is an absolute freak out there. Um, the entire offense right now. I think Kyler Murray is playing okay at best, and Trey McBride is their everything right now. So uh, this team is destined for the third pick, which likely means Marvin Harrison Jr., and then they'll see if they're going to franchise tag or sign Marquise Brown to a long-term contract. In the meantime, it'll just be every opportunity to get Trey McBride going. He left with a little bit of a stinger shoulder injury, but played through it. Uh, hopefully that doesn't like linger into this next week, but absolute dominant. Yeah, and these are some defenses to get at over the next few weeks, I think. The Bears, the Eagles, and the Seahawks for them in terms of linebackers. I mean, obviously, Jermaine Edmonds is athletic on the Bears, but like we have talked about it with the Eagles that, hey, get after their safeties and linebackers, and then no one plays you know, in week 18. Um, but that is Bobby Wagner against Trey McBride at times. So Yep, he's been the number one in usage this month. So uh, I, will, I will be considering him first overall now that we have kelsey kind of regressing oh okay I, i'm taking him serious man he, this guy is oh, no, no joke he is no joke i totally agree with you okay that does it anything else you want to say before we get out of here um no uh new schedule for this week maybe late in the week we have tinker yeah, with yeah. so i am driving back down to north carolina on friday um so we will try to record all three tiers and rankings videos before that happens because the schedule is so crazy for creators like this week. I mean, it's, it, it it could not be worse Thursday to Saturday, a full Sunday slate three on Monday. (laughs) And then the next week is new year's Eve of games. So there will be no instant reaction show this week because we want to spend time with our family on Christmas Eve and then also on Christmas day. So, we will somewhat do a combined instant reactions in stats versus film Mm -hmm. next Tuesday. So there will be stats versus film next week. There will be no instant reactions Mm -hmm. on Sunday night. I do plan on doing a stream on Sunday morning though. Sunday morning stream. Yes. Christmas, Christmas Eve. That's Christmas Eve. Yes, it is Christmas Eve. I will also do one. There we go. I will do one on Christmas Eve, Saturday morning. Not no, 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 guys. Guys, I won't be in good shape Saturday morning. Just, just from that out there. Nice. Okay. That does it for us. For producer Weeze, who handled the reverse mm-hmm. alphabetical order extremely well. Dog. For Hayden. I am Josh. We'll see you all on Friday when Aston Villa could go top of the league. Wow. We'll actually see you tomorrow. Up the Villa. We'll talk to y'all soon. See you.